one man who wanted to win it all, and another who had everything to lose. Their missiles brought the world to the edge of the abyss, 360 hours of fear. An island that became the center of the world. Fidel Castro calls it defense. For others, it's a deadly threat. Fifteen days in October 62, between fear and hope. Countdown to World War III. He is a man who loves nature, Nikita Khrushchev, now retired. He was once the lord of the Kremlin, ruler of the Soviet Union. At one time, he had the whole world in his hands. Now his world is one small garden. Not long before he died, he gives an account of his behavior on tape. <laughs> Я бывший шахтер, слесарь, рабочий, а он миллионер, он сын миллионера, он сам миллионер. Мы находимся в виде э, противоположных классов, непримиримых сказать, классов. Тот преследует цели укрепления капитализма, а я преследую цели разрушения капитализма. The Blue Planet, 4,000 million years of life. And for the first time, mankind has the capacity to destroy it all with one blow. In 1962, the world is divided between East and West. The Cold War, a competition to gain atomic power, the balance of terror. At what price? Seventy thousand feet above the ground, a U-2 reconnaissance plane is on a mission authorized by the President of the United States. In its cockpit, Richard Heiser. I knew it was an important mission because I had two generals, Air Force generals, out there to brief me on the on the missions. The target, Cuba. They were pretty well convinced of what was going on. A lot of the people in the intelligence community. But to be able to prove to the people who were not intelligence people, it took a picture. Show me a picture. The suspicion the Soviet atomic missiles might be based on Cuba. Their target, the United States of America. Major Heiser is a specialist on photographic reconnaissance. With this KA-18 strip camera, he can take thousands of exposures in a couple of minutes from an altitude of 12 miles. A risky undertaking for the pilot. I was brief that uh, there was a possibility or a probability that I'd be fired at. The mission was designed to fly as high as I could fly, maximum altitude. And I think any U-2 pilot will tell you that from the time they push the throttle forward on takeoff, the adrenaline shoots. The adrenaline shoots until you land. In the capital of the United States, 
Some still have doubts. The Soviets had never placed their own nuclear missiles outside their own borders. They were highly secret weapons that they feared might fall into the hands of the United States and the West. They were highly dangerous weapons and they did not want those weapons to come under the control of anyone else. The specialists in the Photographic Analysis Center are working overtime. Three miles of film must be developed and evaluated. Thousands of photographs, like searching for a needle in a haystack. Tiny clues, visible only with a microscope. One of the uh, scanners noted that there was changes in the San Cristobal area. So he hands the film over to a missile team, and they knew about uh, what the missile sites looked like in the Soviet Union. The ones in Cuba are a perfect match. When I scribed the circle from San Cristobal, and it included Washington, I knew that Washington, therefore, was going to be a target, certainly. No doubt about it. I knew that this was going to be a, 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 a his, not only historic, but possibly a confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. Pictures that will change the world. Nuclear weapons on the doorstep of the USA. He still doesn't know anything of this. The President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, is holding reception for a state visitor, Algeria's Ahmed Ben Bella. A routine engagement for the youngest president the USA ever had. For many people, John F. Kennedy represents a new hope. He wants to lead his country to new horizons, and he advocates a more open society. With his wife, Jacqueline, he represents a new face of America, the beautiful face of America. A president who knows how to portray himself who understands the powerful effect of images. And who knows how to win people over. Kennedy had great emotional appeal to the man in the street. He knew how to talk to everybody. He had the ability to make anyone think that you were his only mission. That evening, all is still quiet at the White House, the site of historical decisions. Objects that commemorate great times, past triumphs, the rise of America to world power. Now, it just so happened, this was election period, and the president was upper New York uh, state uh, campaigning. And he wasn't going to get home until later that night. George Bundy decided that let the president have a good night rest, and then we'll tell him. His last good night's rest. On the walls, pictures of his predecessors who had to fight many battles in the pursuit of the American dream. What lies ahead of Kennedy? On October 16th, the race against time begins. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy shows him the photographs, the evidence. Soviet missiles that could reach Washington in 10 minutes the greatest danger America had ever encountered in its history. Kennedy knows he has to act, but how? Total shock. Why in God's name did the Soviets do such a thing? 
they must have thought we would react. At least that was our feeling. Why did they do it? Total shock. The Kremlin in Moscow. For centuries, the symbol of power, residents of the czars. But for many years now, Soviet leaders have been in charge behind the red walls. First Lenin, then Stalin, now Nikita Khrushchev. A reception for a delegation of workers and farmers from the Ukraine. The people meet their leader. Nikita Khrushchev has virtually total control over his country. A red czar determined that his land will flourish once more. Like the other members of the Central Committee, he also believes that communism will ultimately triumph. Are the missiles on Cuba part of this plan? Khrushchev wants to achieve parity with the superpower America. This is the threat people are talking about in Moscow. 45 nuclear missiles positioned close to the Soviet sphere of influence. In Turkey and Italy, the Jupiters. Над Хрущевым давлело превосходство американцев в стратегических ядерных силах. Американцы вместе с англичанами и французами имели 5000. Мы имели 300 ядерных зарядов. The response, the SS-4 intermediate range missile. They are part of the plan to achieve parity with American missile capacity. 36 of them designed to make Cuba an impregnable fortress to deter any US attempt at invasion. 36 missiles with nuclear warheads, each as powerful as 66 of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima. A terrible, deadly power. Placing nuclear missiles on Cuba is not only a political challenge, it is a threat to America's very existence. In the Oval Office, everyone agrees on this morning, the missiles have to be removed. Robert Kennedy, the president's brother and attorney general, advocates a vigorous response. But how and when? We had a time advantage as long as the Soviets did not know that we knew. We used that time to formulate carefully our response. Until we were ready with the response, we did not want uh, the Soviets to know that a response would be forthcoming. But what would the response be? Is any response possible that does not rest on arms and lead to war? A peaceful response in the midst of the Cold War? A response that does not entail America backing down or appearing weak. A response worthy of a great power. A response that preserves creation. Because nuclear war would mean the end of everything.
basic tenets of revolution. Colorful picture books record the victory of the revolution over the corrupt Batista regime, the march on Havana, the victory at the Bay of Pigs, the attempted invasion. And presiding over all these heroic deeds, this man, Fidel Castro, the charismatic Maximo leader with all the abilities of a dictator. De todos de los revolucionarios, de los patriotas, será la misma suerte, y de todos será la victoria. Y nuestra, de todos, patria o muerte, venceremos. De la familia Castro, ni la familia del pueblo de Cuba tiene miedo a nada. Nosotros estamos decididos en una pequeña isla. ¿Qué miedo le podemos tener a nadie? No fear, not even of the nuclear bomb. They do not yet know what is happening on their island. Soon. They will be called to arms, women, students, workers, office clerks. Now they are soldiers. Fidel Castro and his brother, Raul, are most worried about a U.S. invasion. America is only 80 miles away as the crow flies. Troops already landed here once, at the behest of the CIA, in an attempt to topple the Castro regime. Constant vigilance is the task of the nation, the way to preserve Cuba. For this, is there also a need for Soviet nuclear missiles? Why did the Soviet Union put the cohetes? Bueno, ellos dijeron que la defensa de Cuba y en parte también, yo no, no, no voy a negar, pero también es un, un equilibrio estratégico en cuanto a, a, a los armamentos de uno y otros países, ¿no? Pero no, no, Cuba no, Cuba no quería los cohetes, ni le hacía falta los cohetes tampoco. And yet, Castro agrees to serve the cause of world revolution. For two months now, ships have been docking at the port of Marial with missile components, as well as tanks and planes, transported on merchant vessels and thousands of soldiers. The biggest secret operation of the Cold War begins. Without the Americans knowing what is happening, the first missiles are established on Cuban soil. From this moment on, the clock starts ticking. The danger of discovery grows from day to day. Secret operations during the night, high-tech missiles on bumpy roads. Khrushchev's game can only really begin when this cargo reaches its destination. Just one missile that is ready for launching triggers fear. The sandy path behind San Cristobal becomes a road in this nuclear adventure. Six launch pads are erected, sheltered by the mountains of Guaniguanico, 10 minutes from here to Washington. Will World War III be set in motion from this field? On this day, the Soviets and the Cubans do not realize that 20,000 meters above their heads Another reconnaissance aircraft is in the air. New photographs. New evidence. At the same time, in Washington, black limousines pull up outside the White House. U.S. Treasury Secretary Douglas Dillon. Vice President Lyndon Johnson. 
Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Kennedy's brother Robert, Attorney General. And General Maxwell Taylor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is to play a special role. It was a, a tense meeting, it was a tense day. All of us knew that it was unprecedented, that there had never been a nuclear confrontation in the history of the world, and uh, we were about to face one. A meeting like none that had gone before. The mood is one of extreme tension. Pressing a switch under the desk, President Kennedy starts a tape recorder without the others present knowing about it. Is he trying to cover himself because so much is at stake? The fear that, that if we did not force the missiles out, the Soviets would move aggressively elsewhere in the world against the Western interests, against the freedom and strength of the West elsewhere in the world, was ever present in our minds. And it was a very, very deep-seated fear. The executive committee for XCOM, the hastily convened crisis committee, the best and the brightest, as they will later be dubbed. The reconnaissance photographs are analyzed in particular with regard to one question. When will the Soviet missiles become operational? Within a week, the experts estimate. Is that enough time to respond? And what should that response be? An invasion? A bombing raid? Diplomacy? Or a blockade of Cuba? Only one thing is certain. The missiles have to go. But can that be achieved without a war? People around the table became weary, frustrated, fearful, sometimes uh, emotional, understandably so. It was an emotional moment in our lives and in the life of our country and our planet. They have to find an answer, but secretly, for Moscow still does not know how much they know. Time they must use to its best advantage. Time for all arguments to be advanced. Where do the risks lie? One is to be found in Central Europe. There was a very serious risk of, of Soviet pressure on Berlin. Uh, they tried it in, in uh, 1961, in the fall, and we were concerned. Many believed that uh, if we didn't force those missiles out, they would try it again in 1962 or 63. It was a major concern for us. The Berlin Wall, its cement barely dry. It was erected just 15 months earlier, a symbol of division, not just of Germany, but of the whole world. West Berlin is a thorn in the flesh of the Soviets. And since they can't get rid of it, they have to wall it in. West Berlin's uh, principal protection at that stage was the uh, pane of glass uh, theory. The Soviets knew that if they broke that pane of glass by moving in on uh, West Berlin, there would be an overwhelming Western response, nuclear or otherwise. This pane of glass, surrounded by a wall, is where east and west diverge, hostile worlds separated by no man's land. But the calm is deceptive. Conflict is fermenting. Man merkte, da baut sich irgendetwas auf. Wir haben auch angefangen nachzudenken, weil wir natürlich sofort wussten, wenn es dort kritisch wird, wird es in Berlin kritisch. Es wird in Berlin kritisch, weil das der schwächste Punkt geografisch isoliert war. Ich habe noch einen Koffer in Berlin. Deswegen muss ich nächstens wieder hin. West Berliners are accustomed to living with this threat and react with their own brand of dry humor. They also see themselves as islanders on an island of affluence. But they are at the mercy of the reverberations of international politics. Are they helpless? 
Wenn die Elefanten anfangen zu tanzen, gehen die Mäuse am besten zur Seite. Und das war nun wirklich zwar keine Elefantenhochzeit, aber eine potenzielle, ein potenzieller Kampf der Giganten. Und da sind alle anderen sehr gut beraten, still zu sein und zur Seite zu treten, um wenn möglich nicht getroffen zu werden und zermanscht zu werden. Five hundred miles to the east, the dance has not yet begun. They don't know yet that the missiles have been detected. Khrushchev seems optimistic about redressing the balance of power and protecting Cuba. The missiles will be ready in a week. Then he will be able to present Kennedy with a fait accompli. The Americans will have to accept it, Khrushchev thinks. Khrushchev was a wishful thinker. And he thought that his imagination and his vision of, of, of the world was a correct one, almost always, and on all matters. <laughs> Khrushchev, the man who suppresses all thoughts of possible failure, reality replaced by wishful thinking. Я не думаю, что он целиком понимал менталитет американской нации, а его реакция Белого дома, он рассчитывал так, что они не пойдут на начало войны из-за этих ракет. Khrushchev's foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, pays a visit to the U.S. president. It is supposed to be a routine meeting. But it is, in fact, another round in the game of Cuban poker. 30 minutes in which the cards could be reshuffled. I think this was a last opportunity to tell the truth for our country, I mean. Practice friendliness, cautious exploration, a little smile for the photographers. But will the cards be placed on the table? He had the photography ready to confront Gromyko. And Gromyko denied that there was missiles in Cuba. Gromyko puts on a show, pulling out all the stops of diplomacy. He's accompanied by the Soviet ambassador to Washington, who knows nothing of what is happening and is not yet involved in the game. Они меня не информировали с этим. Конечно, это уникальное положение, когда посол не был информирован о событиях, которые являются ключевыми для отношений между двумя главными странами в тот момент. Khrushchev's missile plan is top secret. Nothing is to leak out, and no information is to reach Kennedy. But he made everything to to move. Gromyko to the confession. <laughs> of course, um, Gromyko had no instruction, and he was uh, not a man who was act uh, without instructions. Kennedy, from that moment, was absolutely right not to trust any statement on the part of Kremlin. And the president then said, that lying bastard. And he wouldn't have anything to do with Gromyko after that. Kennedy is also keeping his trump card secret. The photographs that reveal everything remain in his desk drawer. Work on the missile site continues. Five more days. Then the first of the missiles will be ready for deployment. Peace work at night, when the U.S. reconnaissance planes are blind. The Soviets still believe that their disguise is perfect. Soldiers from special units made to look like agriculture experts. And machines digging away to make Khrushchev's vision come true. The concept of presenting Kennedy with a fait accompli.
one of the 24 launch pads for a total of 36 nuclear missiles. The explosive force of 2,400 Hiroshima bombs. Business as usual, President Kennedy in the election campaign, which has been underway for weeks all over the country. There will be congressional elections in November, and the brilliant candidate presents himself to the cheering crowds as confident, smiling, and sure of victory. Although anxiety about Cuba is always present, the show must go on. His task is not merely to secure votes. Now, his real mission is to preserve his secret until he has an answer. The answer that will determine the future of the Earth. I don't believe that citizens should pay too much attention to what candidates say in the last four weeks of election. I believe the old Emersonian advice that what you are speaks far louder than what you say is the best possible advice in judging a political campaign. Campaign routine, timeless thoughts. Then a curious sentence follows. Is the president aware of its possibly far-reaching consequences? I hope uh, that you're uh, going to be available in 1964. We may need you all over again. I hope uh, that you're... Uh, going to be available in 1964. We may need you all over again. A prophecy? The election campaign is still in full swing, but reality is catching up with Kennedy. The crisis committee is pressing for a decision, his decision. He must return to Washington. A pretext is needed for his sudden departure. The president has caught a cold. Last night in Chicago, the assistant White House physician, Dr. George Berkeley, uh, noticed that the president's voice was uh, very husky. This morning when he examined the president, he found the president had developed a slight temperature and that he was suffering from a minor upper respiratory ailment. That suggested the national security affairs were possibly one of the reasons for the president returning. Is there any truth in this? The president returned because of uh, his cold, because of the advice of his doctor. Washington, Department of Defense. Here, plans were drawn up long ago for a military strike. Many of the generals have been saying for some time that Cuba is a purely military problem. Now the hardliners demand action, air raids. And if that isn't enough, an invasion. General Curtis LeMay, chief of staff of the US Air Force, is one of the hawks a hardliner who believes in bomber command. LeMay was like a guy with a bandolier full of grenades. And he'd walk down the Pentagon corridors and look in and throw a grenade in there and then walk down and throw a grenade over there just to stir up people. And uh, there was an old saying that uh, if you got in a fight with LeMay, uh, always uh, you know, protect your genitals because that's where he was going to hit you. In the White House, everyone knows what the generals want and tries to avoid it. Kennedy had appointed a man as head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who is considered a negotiator, General Maxwell Taylor. Kennedy was disgusted both with his, some of his own actions and the advice he had received. He was mistrustful of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The only person in uniform in those days he seemed to have confidence in was my father. Maxwell Taylor has an office in the White House close to Kennedy. The only military man in the crisis committee, his job is to restrain the other generals and tame the hawks. This was President Kennedy's way of saying, I want Taylor's advice here, and I value it more than I do those of the Joint Chiefs in the Pentagon. One man who is highly displeased by this is Air Force Commander LeMay. He seeks direct access to the president so he can push forward his plan. When they asked him about what he do with Cuba, he said, I'll fry it, that's easy. 
but he was determined that uh, I hate like hell to say this, but uh, I think he would have liked to have unleashed his bomber force. Pressure from the armed forces now dominates all talks held in the White House. Some members of the crisis committee agree with the position put forward by the generals. And the public will surely demand firm action once it becomes known that there are nuclear missiles on Cuba aimed at the U.S. Kennedy and his brother want a resolution that does not entail immediate armed conflict. Disposal of the missiles, but without war. How will Khrushchev react? Will it be sufficient just to threaten him? Or will he regard it as a weakness, which he will then exploit? It is imperative to appear completely resolute. No option should be ruled out, including an invasion. Khrushchev has to recognize that he is left with no choice, and the armed forces have to be kept on alert. LeMay's bombers are useful only to illustrate the threat. In the executive committee, one idea is gaining ground, an unusual scheme, almost an experiment that Kennedy now wants to try. Ships, they could be the key to a solution that does not require any ships to be fired, at least initially. Uh, put the ball in Khrushchev's court. Put the decision to him as to whether to go further up the ladder of escalation. We did not wish to do so. We did not want to drive him into a corner where his only choice was humiliation or escalation. A blockade might prevent Khrushchev's ships from reaching Cuba. Hundreds of Navy vessels are to form a ring around the island. It could be the first step, but would it be enough? A blockade, uh, even if as it would be expected, it would be fully effective in stopping any uh, introduction of new weapons. It wouldn't itself alone do anything about getting rid of the weapons that were already in Cuba. The quarantine experiment might fail. This eventually must be considered. The U.S. Armed Forces have to prepare for all military options against Cuba. 250,000 men, hundreds of tanks, over a 1,000 aircraft. Florida is in a state of emergency. Officially, this buildup is presented as just a harmless maneuver. But how long can Kennedy expect people to believe that? It was an armed camp. It was absolutely bristling with everything we had. And I was confident that if we did make the decision to invade Cuba, that we could do so successfully. In Key West, people guess that all this has something to do with Cuba. Is Castro supposed to be intimidated? Many people here are Cuban exiles who long for the overthrow of the regime. Something is in the air. The first journalist becomes suspicious. One of the major newspapers in the country uh, indicated that they had knowledge that we had photographs of missiles in Cuba, Soviet missiles in Cuba, and that they were planning to, to announce that. And the president then did something that was very unusual. He called the publisher and asked him not to publish that information. The publisher complies with this request. That's the only time that has happened in the seven years I was secretary. But one reporter investigates on his own initiative. We went to a place in Georgetown in Washington called the Carriage House. And there I saw a group of uh, people I knew from the State Department, uh, high-level officials in the areas of um, the Caribbean, which would include Cuba, of course. I had immediate suspicions, so I went over to them and said, hi, fellas, what are you all doing together on a Sunday after evening? Uh, sitting around here having dinner together and they all turned green 
They wouldn't tell me anything, but I went back home and I made a lot of phone calls around to people I knew and came to the conclusion that there were indeed offensive missiles, potentially nuclear, in Cuba uh, by the Soviets. I called New York, talked to the desk at the New York Herald Tribune, my paper, and dictated a story. So as far as I know, that was the first uh, hard story that there were indeed missiles in Cuba. On this particular morning, Kennedy knows the time has come. Today, he will have to unveil the secret, perhaps the most important speech of his life. President Kennedy will address the nation tonight on radio and television on a subject of the highest national urgency. The White House asked for the time shortly after noon today. The president has been engaged this morning in a number of meetings uh, with key people in the administration. Now, the newspaper reports come thick and fast, but the people in the street still haven't been told what is going on. The Cuban crisis is still confidential. Eight hours from now, all of mankind will be told what is at stake. The White House is besieged by the press. Reporters from the Soviet Union are also welcome for the first time in years. They are supposed to experience the drama of this historic moment at first hand. From the cabins of the correspondents, the tension is transmitted all around the world, as is the endless speculation. Speculation is also rife here. Khrushchev is alerted by the foreign ministry, and the leading figures in the Communist Party are rapidly assembled. waiting for the Soviet leader. A collective guessing game in the foyer. Have the missiles in Cuba been spotted? Has the whole thing been uncovered? Khrushchev is still on his way to his headquarters. Thousands of thoughts occupy his mind. Kennedy must know about the missiles, no doubt about it. But how will he react? Does he have to expect the worst? If the president tomorrow breaks and starts an attack, you can imagine an attack. And in response to the attack of these 250,000 Americans, they start a nuclear attack. And they kill 250,000 Americans. They kill all the American airplanes. They kill them all the time. Допустим, 500 самолетов. Что будет сделать Кеннеди? Но он уничтожит Кубу. Это понятно. Он применит свое ядерное оружие. А дальше? For the Americans know nothing about one type of weapon already in place on Cuba: short-range nuclear weapons. Unlike the big bombs, these are tactical weapons designed for the battlefield. The Luna. They can be used to eliminate thousands of attackers at a stroke. The Lunas. Could they trigger World War III? Американцы не знали ничего. Это вот очень опасно. То они вообще ничего не знали о тактических ракетах и так что они там есть. Если бы они напали, я считаю, что командующий там генерал армии Клив это оружие примет. Be watching next Saturday night at the same time for part two of Cuban Missile Crisis Declassified. Stay with us now for The Iron Chef.